I want to welcome everybody to OPAC. Great to see a wonderful crowd out today to uh, hear our great speaker, Claire Lopez, and a little bit from General Jerry Boykin, who will join us later in July and give a full presentation. But before we start today, oh, let me welcome our statewide, nationwide Facebook audience. Always wonderful to have you here and always wonderful to hear from you from time to time. So we're going to open in a word of prayer and then, um, oh, Paul Kelly, there he is. Paul's going to lead us in a pledge, and then we'll sing the uh, fourth verse, the prayer verse of our national anthem. So if you would, uh, pray with me. Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, King of Kings, our Creator. We bow our knees before you humbly and present ourselves as your servants and your vice regents on this earth to further your kingdom and extend your glory over the entire planet. And Father, you're more than our Lord and Master. You're our Redeemer. By your very blood, you've saved us, redeemed us, cleansed us, and made us your bride. And we pray that you would bless this meeting, that you would anoint all the things that are said. And Father, make us effective here in the state of Oklahoma and nationwide. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Paul? Saturday, and where's our host to that? Right here, right here. You can't miss her. So that's one to four in Edmond, and uh, she has more of these. You can get those if you want to join the party. So um, Charlie Meadows wants to talk to you. I think you know Charlie. Yeah. He's been up here before. Well, actually, he's been, he's been our main speaker all year. All right. Charlie Meadows. Thanks, Bob. I said I wouldn't waste any time talking about the 15 minutes it's going to take today. Uh, no, actually, just wanted to give you an update. After five months, uh, we are in excess of 260 dues-paying members at Oak Pack. Our all-time record is 290, so we're getting very close. Thank you, all of you who have joined. For those of you that have not yet, please consider doing so. You'll see these cards on the table. Basic membership is $50 a year. We have one called the Legislative Ground Troops, that's $10 a month. We have the Oak Pack Elephant Brigade, that's $15 a month. We have the Rhino Hunting Permit, $30 a month, and the Doc Donkey Roundup Authority at $100 a month. So you either pay it all in one check, or Susan will draft it out of your checking account if you would like, and if you ever want to get out, just let us know, and we won't draft anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You just saw a miracle. In less than a minute. I found out a few years ago my check, checking account was being drafted. I guess Charlie initiated that. I didn't know anything about that. So uh, 
You might want to check your accounts every once in a while. Our nation has never been so close to collapse. I think Washington at Valley Forge had better odds. Our entire way of life is being threatened. Our churches, our governments at all levels, our schools, by an aggressive globalist Marxist assault on Western civilization. A great many of our leaders have failed us, and it's up to us as citizens to get involved or perish. You're here today. You're here today because God has called you to be involved, and it's not optional. It's part of your service as God's vice regents. It's a very dark hour in our nation. The candle of liberty has dimmed, but as we work together, and rally not hundreds but thousands of patriots with us. We will overcome and reignite the flame of liberty and again be the beacon of freedom on the stage, on the world stage. And that's what we're after and that's why we're having this fundraiser with Colonel Allen West. I know $150 is uh, for, for most people a lot of money. And so, but we're asking that uh, you help us. It's a fundraising effort to transform the face of Oklahoma. And America has lost her soul because the church has lost her soul. Until there's a revival in the pulpits of America, we will not, we will not see a transformation of the cultural landscape of America and the political foundations which support it. So I encourage you to talk to Charlie, get a banquet ticket. We already have quite a quite a few coming, I think over 200, between two and 300, but uh, I'd like to see 700. We've sold a lot of uh, business tables, but uh, we need support. All of us have to move together if we're gonna turn Oklahoma around. It's not the leaders, it's all the citizens working together. And with that in mind, I, I am so impressed. Uh, you know, Jerry Boykin, General Jerry Boykin, has been a patriot for years. And he and a number of others has assembled a group of 120. I don't know why it's not 119, 121, but it's 120. I guess you're really precise in the military. 120 generals and admirals, retired, who know that something was a foul in 2020. When you have tens of millions more votes than you have registered voters, probably something went awry. They are here to salvage this nation and rescue it. And you know, when you fight on a battlefield, you come home and you say, I'm not letting these guys take my country right out from under my nose. And they're here to fight for us. We need to support them. So we're, we've asked General Boykin to come be our main speaker in July, either by Zoom or in person. So he'll be here in July, and that's you know July 4th, that's the day. I'm not sure we appreciate the fact that when those signers of the Declaration of Independence signed that, they had no lens of history. They couldn't look into the future. They were a bunch of guys who knew something had to be done and they, they risked forfeiting their lives, and many did, and their fortunes when they signed that document. And men and women, I think you know that's where we are today. We are at war. And so I've asked General Boykin to come in today just for a couple of minutes, talk to us about what he's doing with these generals and admirals, and then I think he's going to introduce our speaker, Claire, because you know each other, am I right? Yes. And so if you would, welcome, give a great Oklahoma Oak Pack welcome to General Jerry Boykin. Thank you very much for the kind words, and can you all hear me now? I'm going to just spend a few minutes with you here uh, talking primarily about uh, what a group of us uh, general officers, uh, we had admirals, we had all services, uh, 
included in a letter that we wrote to uh, the president. We made it an open letter, but it was a letter that we sent essentially to the White House to talk about uh, what we see as, uh, as some of the problems in America today. But let me back up to September and say to you that almost everybody on that list uh, was part of a letter that we also wrote in September before the election in which we outlined our greatest fears and greatest concerns with this election coming up because we see it as we said in September, as the most significant uh, election of our lifetime, all of us. And uh, so what we were trying to do was uh, caution people to vote right, to get out and get to the polls and to understand what was at stake. And we laid it all out. And then we wrote another letter just uh, about three or four weeks ago that really said, we warned you about these things back in September. We told you these were the things we were concerned about. And now we're seeing all of those things unfold. Uh, and, and we had, it wasn't 120, it was actually 124. But since it came out, we've had a bunch of others that said, hey, I want to be on that. I want to be a, a signator on that. So, We've had a, quite a number of others. I, I think the last time I looked, it was about 160 people that were on the, uh, on the letter. What we're trying to say is that this country is in great peril right now because of the leadership that we have. This country is, uh, is going through a very difficult time. Now, can, can you all hear me still? Because I, yeah. my screen is frozen. Yes, we hear. Yes, here. Uh, I'm putting the mic up here to the. Yeah, so if you can talk a little bit more. I can. Where, where do I put the mic? Just as close to that as you can. Yeah. Yeah, if you can hear me, can you hear me? Yeah, I don't hear you. Yeah, he, so he can't hear me. No. Can you tell him we can hear him? <laughs> Hang on, Bob. <clears throat> oh, I can hear him, Reynolds. Yeah. No, I can hear you. Can you hear us now? Yeah, I hear you now. Oh, okay. All right. I have a microphone up to the screen. I think we can hear you. Okay. Where did I lose you? Uh, who was taking those? 160. Oh, 160. 160. Signatories. Okay. Signatories. I think we're I think we're up to about 160 on the on the letter now, and it's going to grow. In fact, I just got an email this morning from a, another guy that wants to join. You know, what's his name on there? But look, what we're what we're trying to say generally is America's in serious trouble. But as you said earlier, I mean, our whole future is at stake right now. And in four years of this administration, we, we could destroy the very foundations of this nation. And, uh, and, and we don't want to see that happen. And look, we all took an oath. We took an oath to the Constitution of the United States. It said, I do solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, part of the mess. Now, what we've been seeing, and this is one of the things that we pointed out, is we've been seeing really a big con going on. Uh, all this uh, Constantino wire around the uh, the Capitol and the White House and all the National Guard troops and all that, and all this is is a big con. It's a con to try and convince the American public that people like us are the real threat to America. And, and quite frankly, the 6th of January didn't help a whole lot uh, because they're using that in such a significant way. And, and I, I get it. There was a lot of antifa and everything there. Uh, who were the rabble rousers in this thing, but irrespective of that, it still gave them the optics that they needed. The other side is now uh, going after us and using that as one of the reasons just to, you know, for all the troops out on the streets of Washington, the concertina wire and so forth. But what we really are concerned about is this weaponization or politicization of our military. They are supposed to be apolitical. Our military is is here to 
criticize our military. military. No, we're back on. We're back on. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we're most concerned about is the stand down that the uh, president and the secretary of defense called for in our military. That they would stand down and take time to uh, focus on critical race theory and uh, inclusion and uh, the LGBT rights and all of those things and, I, and, and and we we asked the question simply how does that contribute to being able to win the nation's wars in 1963 douglas MacArthur stood in the mess hall of west point and he looked at the uh, assembled students there and uh, uh, officers of the future and he said to them your your mission remains determined fixed inviolable and it is to win the nation's wars that has not changed it's still to win the nation's wars but if you look at this administration when our president came out to really make this was about three or four weeks ago to make his first real statements on the, on our military and what his priorities were going to be what did he say he said he was proud to announce that he had directed that uh, flight suits, what aviators wear, flight suits were going to be refashioned to accommodate pregnant women. And then he went on to say, and we're going to uh, make sure that the helmets will fit women so they can wear their hair down. And what do you think every soldier, sailor, airman, marine, and coast guardsman was thinking in terms of the president's priorities? What were his priorities winning the nation's wars? Absolutely not. It's about social experiments, and that's not what our military was created for. And I gotta tell you folks, if we don't start raising cane with our members of Congress and tell them that this is just nonsense and we're not going to stand for this. And if they can't do something about it, then we'll look for people who can to elect into these offices in the Congress. House and Senate. They have to stop this nonsense because look around the look around look at the world that we live in and look at the threats look at this thing that I, I'm going to do the media tonight about hacking of these meat processing uh, plants and this big company that handles about 20 percent of our meat processing in the country has been hacked and now there's going to be a a, a, a meat shortage. And, and, and three weeks ago, it was the uh, gasoline. What's next, the power grid? We need to get our military focused on the real threats to America. And I, that said, I want to tell you that your next speaker, who is uh, just a really courageous person, uh, who spent most of her professional career with the CIA, she is an incredible analyst, she, she has been focused on terrorism for a long time. Long before it was popular to be watching what was going on with Iran and what was going on with, uh, with the uh, Islamic Jihad, what was going wrong with, with the Islamic terror groups around the world, to include right here at home with the uh, Council on American Islamic Relations and other types of groups. But, that we're all part of the Muslim Brotherhood. She's been focused on that for a long time. When nobody else wanted to talk about it, when nobody else thought that we should take it seriously, Claire Lopez was really focused on that. She was warning people. She was linked up with others that understood the issue. And she was trying to make sure that Americans knew that there was a threat there and that they were prepared to do something about it. And, uh, and I got to tell you, she is uh, she's a really dear friend. So, uh, Claire, thanks for being on this program. God bless you, and uh, over to you. Jerry, thank you so much. That was a wonderful, warm introduction. I, I appreciate it so much um, coming from you. It's great to see you. Uh, even if uh, only over a screen, um, but your words are um, absolutely the message that we need to hear. 
Um, and uh, I'm glad to see all of you here in the room today. Thank you so much for coming, for joining with us today. Um, I am going to talk about uh, the overall threat of what I'm calling America under siege. Um, now, I, I realize that we're on a very tight schedule, so uh, I, I will apologize in advance because I'm going to have to skip through uh, approximately half of this presentation, but I'll go as fast as I can. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so let me, let me just launch into this because uh, there's way more in here than we're going to be able to get to today. I, I think I've got a hard stop at uh, 1300. So let's go. Uh, will this work? Yes. We'll skip that page. We'll skip that page. All right. Um, as, as, as General Boykin just, just uh, told us, we are at a turning point uh, in this country where the choice before us is freedom or tyranny. Uh, I'm quoting from the CEO of Goya Foods here, Robert Inanue, who was on the Fox News program some months ago, earlier this year, and he even realized, he said, we've got an iceberg of communism ahead of us. Um, wait a minute. All right. Um, the communist threat is where we'll start with this today, because I think that overall, uh, what is our greatest enemy and our greatest threat today, sorry if I'm turning my back to, to all of you there, um, the greatest threat is coming out of Beijing. In the beginning, uh, the communist revolution back in 1917, that was Russia. But for many years, yes, uh, Moscow, the KGB, spent a lot of time uh, up against those guys. They were the leadership of the worldwide communist uh, movement. But I would say that today that has shifted. It has shifted and it is now the Communist Chinese Party, the CCP, uh, that leads the global communist movement. And so there has been, in a way, a, a passing of the baton. However, as General Boykin just pointed out with his attack of the, um, the meat processing company, what is it, JNS, I think, yeah. that um, has hacked into uh, you know, uh, that Moscow has hacked into, and, and make no mistake, it's Moscow. Uh, they, they have, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll blame uh, a criminal organization or, you know, some, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, group that they'll disclaim association with. But no, make no mistake, this is Putin, this is Moscow. Uh, getting ready, by the way, for a, um, a meeting, a summit with uh, the president. President Joe Biden, um, kind of laying down a marker uh, in advance. First, as, as General Boyden said, came our, um, our uh, fuel pipeline, and now it's, now it's the meat supply. Um, so I'm not counting out Moscow. I'm not discarding or discounting Moscow, uh, but, but generally the leadership of the Communist Party in the world today and in the revolution, we're in a revolution, yes, in America, it is China. All right. Let me see if it'll move. Yes. Um, all right, two stages uh, to this revolution. Uh, and uh, I would say that we have um, spent many decades in the first part of that. Uh, subversion is the first part of the revolution. Uh, been going on since the 1917 revolution in Russia. The second phase of the tipping point comes when it shifts over to violence. Um, that's kind of where we are right now, on our streets, right? Okay, I'm going to skip critical race theory because we could spend the rest of the day on this, but that is, an, uh, it, that is an element that must not be discarded or discounted um, because it's all through our education system, but there's just no time to go into it today. Um, all right, the objective of all of this for the communist revolution is chaos. They seek chaos, they want chaos. Because when society collapses as they intended to, that's what they want to happen, they think that out of that will come their chance to seize control. And it's not like they have some kind of a 
you know, a, a utopian blueprint that they're going to uh, institute once, once our society, our republic, our constitution collapses as they wish it to. No, it is nihilist. It is pure nihilist. I'll recommend a book to you. I'm, I'm uh, almost finish it, finished with it right now. It's like 400 pages thick, so I warn you, but it is Paul Kangor's new book called uh, The Devil and Karl Marx. The Devil and Karl Marx by Paul Kangor. And uh, that is a very good explanation of what communism, Marxism is all about. It is about nihilism. It is about what they say on the streets, right? Burn it all down. Isn't that what they say? Burn it all down. Uh, they don't mean in order to build up something better in its stead. That's not what they mean. They mean destroy it. So nihilism. We're in, oops. Can I go backwards? One back, if you would. Okay, uh, Minneapolis last summer, last May, was obviously the tipping point between that subversive phase that I talked about and the violent phase we're in right now. Um, it wasn't planned, it wasn't uh, something that was staged or orchestrated, it happened. Um, but the tinder that was set ablaze had long since been piled high. And that's when we tipped over into this violent phase and that is where we have been ever since. All right. Please advance. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, first comes the narrative in political warfare. The narrative is about the memes and the words and the lexicon, uh, the words like we've all seen now. Uh, it's a systemic racist society, white supremacy, white uh, guilt, white uh, fragility, all of that stuff. Those are narratives. Those are memes. They proceeded by getting into our heads or trying to get into our heads. They proceeded the physical demonstration of obedience to those narratives. On this slide here, what you're looking at are all sorts of uniformed officials, officers of police forces, yeah, the FBI too, mayor of Los Angeles in the middle there, uh, Eric Garcetti, uh, all taking a knee in the middle of the street in uniform to the mob. That is when you tip over from narrative to physical demonstration of obedience to the mob. That's what's going on. All right, um, I want to mention another book to you here. This one is by W. Cleon Skousen. He uh, was a former FBI agent, served in the earlier part of, uh, middle part of last century in the 1900s, um, and he wrote this book called The Naked Communist. It was published in 1958, but what it did was put together all of his experiences as an FBI agent fighting against communism for many years, uh, and then in a later edition, not the first one, but maybe around uh, 1961, I think, he added chapter 13, which is the 45 goals of communism. I would recommend, if you don't even read the whole book, you can, you can find the PDF of just that chapter, the 45 goals of communism, as a standalone PDF online. And have a look at that. It is his understanding and distillation, also from the congressional testimony of com uh, communists and former communists, in the early 50s of what they intended to do, what their program was for collapsing America. And among those uh, 45 goals are things like gain control of one or both of the political parties in the US. Check. Uh, get control of the schools. Number 17 is one I emphasize a lot. Get control of the schools, the curriculum, the textbooks, the teachers associations. Think they did that? That's critical race theory, right? Check. Uh, a whole bunch of other things that you can see going on in society today of the 45, there's scarcely a one, if even a one, that's not got a check mark next to it. They've done all that. They've infiltrated uh, popular culture. They've infiltrated the media, obviously, and yes, they've infiltrated uh, the government at every level. All right, let's just keep going here. Please, it's not. Okay, uh, you've probably heard me talk before about the red, black, green axis. Red for communist, Marxist, Maoist. Black for the Black Lives Matter movement, which is Marxist and also Maoist. And green for Islam. Around this slide you see some um, logos of, of these various groups. Saul Alinsky, of course, up in the corner on the left. Muslim Brotherhood logo up on the right. Communist hammer and sickle in there. 
And up in the middle, that is the logo of the United States Council of Muslim Organizations. That is the very first Muslim Brotherhood political party umbrella group in America. Within it, underneath that grouping, are groups like General Boykin mentioned, CARE, Council of American Islamic Relations, uh, ISN Islamic Society of North America, ICNA, et cetera, et cetera, many more. Those are the three, red, black, green. Um, now, this is Nihad Awad, uh, whose photo is there. Nihad Awad is the executive director of CARE. CARE is the US branch of Hamas, foreign terrorist organization on the list. Uh, and Hamas itself is the Gaza branch of the Muslim Brotherhood founded originally, of course, in Egypt. Well, here's Nihad Awad, who's head of the Hamas uh, US branch. And he's speaking here in late 2015, just in advance of then the upcoming 2016 presidential election year. And here's what he said, speaking to a great big conference full of brothers, Muslim brothers. Black Lives Matter is our matter. Black Lives Matter is our campaign. That's when the green and the black forged an alliance. That alliance holds to this day. If you go to any one of their websites, home pages or social media sites, you will see um, mutual support, recognition, um, events where they appear at each other's events. <clears throat> All right, uh, this is a very recent, I mean, just, you know, just barely last month, a couple weeks ago, uh, from the Black Lives Matter website, or I'm sorry, the uh, Twitter page, the Twitter page of BLM, with an explicit statement of support for Hamas. Of course, that during uh, the Hamas uh, attacks offensive against Israel at that point in time, and Black Lives Matter uh, on their website, on their Twitter page, full on uh, support. Um, these are a couple of posters um, that announced um, Day of Rage and demonstrations. Um, another uh, example just of the alliance, the close working alignment between the BLM and the, um, the uh, Hamas terrorists. The squad. You know where that term, the squad, comes from? I wasn't even sure about this myself until I reread the little red book of Mao Zedong. The little red book of Mao Zedong is a collection of his sayings, and it's in that little red book. Well, the squad is in there. The squad is a unit of leadership in a, in a communist revolution. That's, what, that's what's in the book. Now, I don't know if AOC knows that. I mean, who knows what she knows, but um, <laughs> others within the leadership of this communist revolution certainly know about that quote from Chairman Mao. In any case, here we go with the squad uh, explicitly supporting Hamas and terrorism as well. Um, where did the Black Lives Matter movement come from? Let's start first with the black. I mean, we talked a little bit about the, the green. Let's go to the black of, of the axis. Formed around 2013, 2014, uh, and it was a front project of a pre-existing Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, a group called the Freedom Road Socialist Organization that had been in existence for quite a long time and, and still is. Um, and um, there was a split in Freedom Road and a branch of it was called the Liberation Road and from Liberation Road comes Black Lives Matter movement. But again, back there about 2013, 2014. Um, and uh, here's a quote from the Black Lives Matter movement website. Some of this has been scrub, so uh, it might not still all be there, but there's this thing, it's called the Wayback Machine. If it's been on the internet, it never goes away. So this particular quote, uh, I thought worth uh, noting, this is the one about, uh, yeah, disrupting the Western prescribed um, nuclear family structure. So that's what they stand for. Um, let's go to the next one. Uh, yes, Black Lives Matter is in the schools. There is a website even. They have a website called blacklivesmatteratschool.com. And at that website are all kinds of resources for teachers, including lesson plans, reading lists, books, references, and so forth. And oh yes, uh, they are endorsed by the National Education Association. 
You wonder where critical race theory comes from and how it got inside the schools? That's part of it. Okay, this is more about the background of Freedom Road Socialist Organization, the parent, if you will, of uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and we'll just keep going here. Liberation Road, as I said, is the offshoot from it and from which BLM more directly uh, comes. Um, the uh, connection between the Black Lives Matter movement and China, the Communist Party of China, is very important to notice, as I've said before, about uh, the leadership of, um, of the uh, communist movement worldwide is now Beijing and the CCP. But this isn't just uh, right now. This dates back. You'll maybe remember that back in the 1960s, there was a revolutionary activity going on then too. Uh, and there were uh, African-American revolutionaries belonging to the Black Panthers and others like them. They were very closely associated with the Communist Party in China. People don't realize this. I wrote an article that was published last October in uh, Epoch Times called uh, Race, Revolution, and the CCP outlines all of this that I, I don't have time to go into here, but just to say that they're very closely linked. And back then, they sent delegations over to, Ma, uh, to Beijing to meet with Zhou Enlai, with Mao Zedong on a regular basis. And we know that because there were photo ops and they put the photos all over uh, publication. Um, all right, let's talk about the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, where they come from. Uh, this one, the first, is Alicia Garza. You can see that she comes out of former uh, associations with uh, groupings, organizations that are communist and Maoist. She is one of the co-founders. Uh, the next co-founder we'll talk about is Opal Tometi. Uh, she um, also comes out of earlier existing pro-Marxist uh, communist um, and uh, even, yes, George Soros funded Freedom Road Socialist Organization Connections. Um, and the next one is, uh, oh, this is about uh, her um, nice little photo op here with Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela uh, back a few years when there was a conference held in New York that she attended and uh, he was there. And they took the opportunity for this nice little uh, photo op there. Um, this last founder is uh, Patrice Cullors. Now, I, I can't even keep up with these slides because things are changing so fast, but she is the one you probably know uh, just recently uh, publicly resigned from the Black Lives Matter movement uh, after the word about her, uh, shall we say, real estate um, portfolio um, became public. Uh, but this is her background. I know this slide is kind of crammed rather full, but uh, her background, like the other two, uh, goes back to other organizations, communist, uh, Marxist, Maoist, and uh, she's the one, uh, let's see, uh, I'm sorry, it was, uh, it was Oval to many, I wanted to mention, the, the previous one who had been trained by Weather Underground, Eric Mann, but, you know, she's got quite the resume here, um, however, no longer now uh, with Black Lives Matter movement, I guess she can, you know, retire to one of her, how many homes? Four, four homes. So uh, she's no longer there. Uh, the hashtag defund the police um, became, uh, uh, it, it was first posted at the, at the Black Lives Matter website, or I should say Twitter, Twitter site, uh, and this appeared last year, May of 2020. Uh, and it was the beginning of the defund the police movement all over the United States. The Black Lives Matter. Here is Black Lives Matter, uh, which um, has led uh, several, uh, quite a number of delegations over to the Middle East. And here you can see, um, this is a few years ago, this photo, but nevertheless, nice little photo up there with um, uh, Islamic jihadis. Um, and you can see the Palestinian flag perhaps flying in the back there, the red, black, and green flag. Flying. So uh, that's uh, got that. So um, this is right here in the United States, the Fairfax neighborhood of Los Angeles, California, and this is last year. This photo is from last summer in, I think, June or so of uh, 2020. And uh, this is the side, the wall of a synagogue uh, in the Fairfax neighborhood, uh, um, a, a Jewish neighborhood, community lives there. Um, uh, uh, spray painted on the side of, uh, of their synagogue. And this is only one of like five that were defaced, at least. Maybe I have even the numbers low. 
but many were defaced and vandalized. But, you know, um, free Palestine, uh, F Israel, what's that got to do with George Floyd? Well, you can see it's got nothing to do with it, but it's about the, uh, the red and the black and the green. Uh, that is why I call it an axis uh, of alignment. Um, this is more recent. This is very recent. Uh, you may know that the Jewish uh, celebration of Shavuot, which is the celebration of the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, um, it finished. It's a two-day um, uh, commemoration holiday for the Jewish people. It finished a couple of weeks ago, and uh, right on the night uh, that it ended, uh, it happened to be a Tuesday night, um, there were, uh, again, out in the Fairfax neighborhood, heavily Jewish community neighborhood of Los Angeles, um, cars flying up and down the street, people coming, uh, hurling uh, anti-Semitic slurs out the window, the passengers, and then people actually getting out of the cars to attack diners, for example, at this particular uh, outside restaurant there. Um, and then, uh, this is closer to home, right? Uh, when uh, BLM activists invaded the legislature uh, here in Oklahoma and uh, for a time, I guess, shut down the proceedings before they could begin again. Uh, so it's everywhere. This is out on the West Coast. Uh, this is um, uh, photos uh, from this year again, from May. Uh, I don't know if you can read up on the highway sign there, uh, but what is scrawled in white on that, that highway sign is mayhem. It says mayhem. So you can see again what I'm talking about. Marxism is nihilism, it's destruction. It's not about creating some lovely, lovely new utopia, it's mayhem. Um, and then again, the riots. All right, let's go to the, um, oh boy. Let's go to the, um, uh, the red, specifically red part of this. Again, Saul Alinsky, Rules for Radicals. I'm sure you've all seen that or read it. Uh, and um, he is very closely affiliated with the green part of the axis, and we know that because the USCMO, the United States Council of Muslim Organizations, the Brotherhood Umbrella Group, right, uh, is itself extremely closely uh, aligned with Alinsky's uh, Industrial Areas Foundation, his organization that he founded. He's no longer around, but the organization still is. Uh, and so are its objectives. What is Antifa? Well, Antifa is a word that is short for anti-fascist. And it comes out of Germany, where it was called Antifascistische Aktion. And the reason that it was in Germany is that after the Russian Revolution, uh, it was thought that Germany would be the next most likely place for a communist revolution. And they already had uh, cells there, communist cells there. And um, so they tried. But this is the 1920s and 1930s, and the rise of the Nazis and fascists um, basically defeated them. They, they fought in the streets, the black shirts of the communists, that's why it's black block Antifa to this day. Black block means the black outfits, black shirts back then, the brown shirt Nazis, the Nazis won. Communists then turned their attention to the United States. That's when they came here, back in the 1930s. That's how long Antifa, or at least its uh, progenitors, its, its antecedents, have been here in the United States. Um, and uh, so the, uh, as I said, the, um, right, it, we'll, we'll skip through this one because that, that's basically about the conflict that, that got them kicked out of Germany. Um, fast forward to about 2016, this is uh, not that long ago, uh, and that is when the FBI and DHS first sort of kind of became uh, sort of kind of aware that there was an Antifa and that it was a problem. Um, they're not paying attention anymore, not now. Uh, but back then they kind of a little bit sort of did, but that's been way overtaken now by white supremacy and you know extremism and all the ranks. Um, Antifa does have global connections still. It's not just here. They have very close connections in cities across Western Europe. And as well, they have trained, their cadres have trained in both Hong Kong, with the Hong Kong Freedom Democracy Fighters, uh, and in the Middle East. Let me show you a little bit of that. Um, first of all, how does Antifa organize? It's not hierarchical like an org chart where you can say the president and the vice president, you know, treasurer and secretary and all of that. It is horizontal, meaning that there are cells in many, many cities, as I've said, around the world and they are connected to one another uh, across uh, the geography of those cities, those cells. 
That's how they're organized. Um, they very uh, much organize on social media as far as getting to places, meeting places, um, you know, when they're going to have uh, a riots. Um, and by the way, they also are very closely affiliated with BLM. They train together, I mean train. They study Marxist doctrine together. And they also train in gyms together for their street tactics. Um, here they are in Syria. This is a few years ago, but uh, Atifa Qadri's went to Syria to link up with uh, some Kurdish forces there and get training from the Kurds. You can see the flags flying in this photo. Uh, so they learned that and brought that back here. Um, and they also trained in Hong Kong, as I said. They went there to watch the uh, Hong Kong democracy freedom fighters and learn their tactics of organization and street protests and brought that back here, by the way, yes, to the U.S. Capitol on June, uh, January the 6th. Uh, the tactics, uh, in, in particular, the use of the organization, the agent provocateur, for example, uh, but other means of organization were very evident here in the Capitol uh, on January the 6th. Tactics can be found in this book. You might have seen it. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting book. Mark Gray wrote it. Um, it. Just a reference for you if you'd like to look up more about Antifa. Um, all right, we'll go to the next. Unmasked is another very good resource for you if you'd like to look at more. You may have heard the name of Andy No, N-G-O, No, Andy No, uh, is the son of Vietnamese boat people who fled communism out of Vietnam. And they... Um, settled in eventually Portland, Oregon. Uh, sorry about the echo there. Uh, but in any case, uh, that's where Andy grew up in Portland, Oregon, and began following Antifa there in what they call the Rose City Antifa, the first Antifa in the country. Uh, and out of all of his experiences, which you can find and maybe have seen already on social media, he wrote this book, Unmasked, which came out uh, I think earlier this year. In any case, it's a very good reference. Um, we'll just flip through these, some photos of, of Antifa on the street. Become ungovernable, war. All my heroes kill cops? And who raised this child? Um, next, uh, by any means necessary. I'm going to flip through very quickly now in a number of affiliated organizations that are part of the Antifa umbrella. Because it too is an umbrella. A, a, a grouping of groups, if you will by any means necessary is one of those. Uh, Crime Think is another. All of these websites you can find and, and look at what they're talking about. Campus Anti-Fascist Network, yep, they're organized all over the campuses, university campuses in the US. Redneck Revolt, uh, that's another one. Um, the Red Guards of Austin, Austin, Texas, they're a very large one and uh, they date back quite a number of years too. Uh, this is more uh, from Red Guards, Austin, everywhere a battlefield is kind of their slogan, I guess you'd say. The Revolutionary Communist Party, yes, it, does, it still exists. As a matter of fact, uh, RevCom USA endorsed uh, the Joe Biden campaign for president, uh, and uh, he very gratefully accepted that um, endorsement. Uh, the Workers' World Party, uh, it's uh, not just um, pro-Moscow or pro-China, but pro pro-North Korean, the regime of Kim Jong-un. And they openly <coughs> attest to these things on their websites. Uh, the Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement is important because it is in, uh, in favor of abolishing all prisons. No more prisons. And they want to set up an underground railroad to free prisoners from jails in the United States and get them to freedom, or the streets or whatever. Uh, Indivisible is not a violent street movement, but it arose from the Democrat uh, Party um, staffers on uh, Capitol Hill uh, after uh, the 2016 elections. And they then organized cells all around the entire country, there's hundreds of them now, um, to uh, organize against the Trump administration. Refuse fascism, uh, another one, very important, they're present at most of these violent, revolution, uh, violent street actions that you see. More about refused fascism. Um, we need to make this country ungovernable. Uh, it's going down, that's another one. Um, I, I wish I could tell you more about these. Slingshot Collective is important because you can go to their website and find out that they are organized through bookstore fronts in different cities, and they actually list them on their website. The bookstores and those bookstores are the 
uh, the training sites, like in a back room, is where they'll have the Marxist indoctrination training uh, courses for Antifa, for BLM. Uh, that's why they're important. Funders, yes, of course, George Soros, but honestly, you could take George Soros out of the equation tomorrow and it wouldn't make a dent because there's so many other big uh, corporate funders for BLM, and here's a small list of them. I mean small, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Plowshares, um, Ties Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, um, et cetera, you can see. Um, Thousand Currents uh, was the organization that was managing the BLM finances, uh, but they just very recently stepped back, and the Tides Foundation has now graciously stepped up uh, to manage those finances for BLM instead. It formerly, Thousand Currents, was led by Rosenberg, Susan Rosenberg, a former uh, domestic terrorist who got pardoned out of jail by uh, President Bill Clinton. Okay, the role of the CCP. Uh, the Communist Chinese Party, this is very important to understand uh, how they are involved in it. Um, they use information operations primarily um, and use uh, social media very effectively to do that, but not just social media, all other kind of media, meaning newspaper outlets, meaning uh, TV channels, cable TV channels, etc. cetera. Um, and they're able to get away with everything that they do in large part because every one of these parent companies of all these groups, NBC, ABC, CBS, uh, Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, as well as online, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, those companies and or their parent companies, every last one of them has business interests in China, which they look at as a 1.4 plus billion uh, potential person market for them and they don't want to jeopardize that. United Front Work Department is um, subservient or accountable to the, um, the CCP uh, and answers to it and takes its uh, directions for um, information operations working with our media. Uh, Confucius Institutes on the college campuses, we'll skip this one. Um, ah, this is important. Uh, you may remember that last summer, uh, then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo closed the Houston Consulate of the, uh, of the Chinese regime. Uh, you might also know that uh, the Chinese have many other diplomatic facilities in the U.S. The embassies in, in Washington, D.C., of course. The United Nations mission is in New York. And in addition to that, there were uh, five additional consulates, one in New York, one in Chicago, one in Houston, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Well, he closed the one in Houston. And they said that that was because they were engaged in espionage and um, intellectual property theft, which of course they were. But if that's the case, then why the other four stay open? Well, the reason is that they were doing something else in Houston. The Chinese Communist Party sent an undercover unit of the People's Liberation Army, the Army of China undercover to the Houston consulate, and their job was to compile a list using AI and data mining of American citizens that they thought would be susceptible to messaging about street rioting. And once they got the list, then they made videos on TikTok for how to conduct street rioting and, and uh, stage protests and demonstrations. And they pushed that out to the list of American citizens on U.S. soil. They did this. Now, I really wish that they would have told us from the State Department that this is what it was about, but uh, they didn't, but it is available online. Uh, Radio Free Asia is the source um, for that information. Okay, this is closing up now. What is coming? Uh, it is going to be a convergence, as we've talked about through, the day, uh, through, the, through this presentation here today, the red, the black, and the green. A convergence of America's enemies, um, are, are, are aligning together to take down this, this, this republic of ours. Um, yes, they, they, they have different ideologies, and you'll say, well, how in the world? You know, they're not compatible, really. And it doesn't matter, because right now the number one goal is the takedown, the collapse of the republic, the collapse of the constitution, the collapse of law and order, and then out of that, uh, each one of them, I guess, thinks that they'll be the one uh, to have the advantage and to seize power. Uh, but that is, that's what's going on. Law and order, the Constitution, uh, the Republic are the targets of all of them right now. Anarchy is absolutely the objective, and here I'm just saying again that, yeah, they're working together, the red, the black, and the green. And so what must we do? Well, number one, thank you for being here because what you're doing is learning about all of this. That's the first step, uh, learning about it and
and, uh, and, and becoming informed. Um, and then, of course, realizing who we are. I've got a much longer presentation I did with the Republican Women's Club yesterday about who we are, but a review of where we come from. Um, you know, what are our first things principles? Um, you know, individual liberty, government by consent of the governed, equality of all in human dignity before the rule of law, that is the Constitution. All of those things, uh, not, uh, as I say up here, not critical race theory. Uh, okay, some more of what we must do will be the next slide. Well, what's on the next slide, I think, is um, about your homework. I've mentioned a number of books uh, as we were talking here today, and those could be uh, a starter uh, place for you. Um, I would very much recommend those 45 Goals of Communism from W. Cleon Skousen. I would recommend very much Andy Noe's book, Unmasked. Um, the, the dog and, ate the homework. <laughs> well, I realize we're kind of at the cutoff point here. Um, I guess what I'll finish uh, is what is on the last slides, and that is, that is simply um, to be proud of who we are, to be proud of our history as Americans. It's not perfect, but that history is the history of the most exceptional, best nation that this world has ever seen. For its faults. But it's success is true. Um, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. There were a couple more slides, but thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you for being with us, and I appreciate everything. Thank you. So don't be nervous. Spend time with the Lord Jesus. And we're going to ask Dr. Aaron Means, if you would close us in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we praise and worship you because, Lord, you are the master of all things. You are all-knowing, nothing slips. Your presence, you're all-powerful, nothing is greater than you. And you are always present. And for that, we praise you because we are your creation. Father, we're here as your servants, and by your strength we'll be unwavering. By your strength we will not fear. Father, we know, my God, that they are patriots that you use to found this nation, that in remote places, my God, their blood still stains this ground. And by your grace and by your power, we will not falter. We will not waver. Just my Father, as your commitment is to us, we stand on the assignment you have given us. And we will not let the false rhetoric fool us, make us tremble, make us back back, make us back down, make us walk away. Make us quiver. We stand, my Father, on your word. And just as in those remote places, my Father, in our land, that the blood of patriots that still stains this ground, we are going to depend on your power to be more fervent and continue to speak your word, continue to pray your word, Continue to study your word and continue to walk on your word. Oh my God. We walk in your truth and we seek your victory that our nation will stand and our flag will stay on that pole. And the principles that are written in the Declaration of Independence and in our Constitution will stand because we stand as your servants and we worship you the God of heaven the God of the Bible we worship you alone it is in Jesus name we pray amen, amen.
Hey, we have one more announcement. One more announcement from Dwayne Schroeder. You know, you were asking what we can do. Well, we need to grow our army is what we need to do. If you're here today as a guest, become a member. Can I ask? If you're here today as a member, we have bring a class? guest to the next meeting. We have if, class, as we please. grow this organization, we can spread it out across the state, and that's part of what we have to do.